Hey, Jeff. Greetings, Brock. How's it going? Okay. Uh, so, who do we have with us today? Well, today we have, and I'm going to say his name in American because he's a, a French citizen, and I'm sure that I cannot pronounce it properly at all. And I think he'll be able to correct us once we get him on the line here about how to actually pronounce his name. But his name is, is none other than Bryce Goglin. And he is the primary developer for the OpenMX project. This is actually a, a fascinating project. I'm, I'm very excited to hear all about it. I, I think there's some really interesting stuff that we can talk about that directly applies to high-performance computing. Yeah, this is something that normally goes into the networking layer of an HPC cluster. So this is definitely your cup of tea much more than mine. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is right in my bailiwick, and I, I think this is really cool stuff. Okay, cool. Well, let's go ahead and get Bryce on the line. Bryce? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Greetings. Thanks for taking some time out for us today. Thanks for the invitation. I wonder if we could uh, start off here, like, uh, you know, h- how do you pronounce your name? <laughs> Brice Gogla. Okay, you're going to have to forgive us ugly Americans. We're going to stick with the American version. We're going to call you Bryce. I hope that's okay. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> okay, thanks. thanks a lot for putting up with us. So first off, um, something we really need to get out there, a lot of people are probably asking, um, what is the relationship between the Miracom MX and Open MX? Because they are related. Yes, they are related. MX works only on Miracom hardware. So Miracom does some uh, specialized NICs, so specialized network uh, interfaces for HPC which can do a lot of stuff like zero copy and low latency communications. They have their own stack to do that, which is called MX. And OpenMX does the same with regular Ethernet hardware. So you can take your laptop uh, with a random uh, Ethernet hardware. It will just work fine and give you the same abilities with, of course, a bit lower performance, but I'm working on that. So a is it just emulating some of the stuff Miracom stuff does in hardware? Yes, exactly. We have um, a Linux kernel module which does basically what uh, the Miracom Nix w- will do in hardware. So everything in user space is the same, but everything that Miracom does in hardware, we try to do it in software inside the Linux kernel. Okay, so when you say lower performance, it's really just because you're not using hardware offload. You're just using a, a commodity Ethernet NIC, right? Yes, because these NICs can do some stuff, but there are quite a lot of things that Miracom NICs and also, also some, some other hardware can do it as well, like Infiniband, but uh, these NICs can do a lot of stuff that regular NICs cannot do. For instance, zero copy and things like that. It's, it's much harder when you don't have hardware support. Okay, so, so if we had to distill this down to the difference, you're doing in a, a software kernel module what the Miracom NICs are doing in hardware. Yes, that that's, that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. And so when you say it's lower performance, you know, about how much lower performance? Well, um, there are two things. If you look at uh, what people will, will, will usually look at, which is latency and bandwidth, on the latency, it's very easy, basically. With MX and Miracom hardware, you, you can get two microseconds easily these days. With OpenMX, it depends on your hardware. So if you have a very, very, very nice uh, uh, Xeon or Opteron or whatever processor with a high frequency, you can get six or seven microseconds with OpenMX. If you have a slower CPU, it depends. It can be 15. And it also depends on the NIC because if the NIC is slow, of course, the, pa- the packet is not going fast to the, up to the host. So the latency can be worse. But if you have very good hardware, you can get to six or seven microseconds. Okay, well, that's the, still great because, like, a, a typical TCP yes. latency could be anywhere from, you know, 20 to 100 microseconds, right? Yeah, right. Okay, um, so with OpenMX, you're really you're just talking, you know, with a software change, with the hardware that you already have, you can get, you know, as low as microseconds, but probably with people with commodity NICs, probably somewhere in the 10 to 20 or 10 to 15 micro yes. range. Yeah. Cool. I noticed that uh, you mentioned for getting low latency, you mentioned CPU performance more than actual NIC performance. Um, does any of these like specialized Ethernet NICs, how, how much do they affect performance over CPU? Well, it's 
it's really a matter of, of the host performance. So CPU and maybe the memory bus and, and IO bus. This is the main reason for getting good latency. But if you have, a, I don't know, fast Ethernet NIC for something, something like that, the latency could be worse because just the NIC uh, can be slow at processing packets. So you can maybe lose a couple microseconds, but most of the, the microseconds are related to the frequency of the host because that's where the actual processing of the, the packet on the receive side, especially, is done. So it's really a matter of the host in the end. Okay, so, so if you have, you know, a, a typical HPC class of server, you know, that's got, you know, nice fast buses and nice fast processors, you, you're, you're probably about halfway there, right? You just need to have a, a reasonable enough Ethernet NIC. Would that, yes, would that be exactly. A, yeah. Okay, good. So, you know... It, you could get a reasonable enough Ethernet NIC that, uh, you know, potentially much cheaper than some of these proprietary offload NICs as well. Yeah, so basically, you can just buy a, a random server from whichever uh, vendor and you, you get some, well, not that good, but not that bad uh, uh, giga, giga, gigabit Ethernet NIC and you can get 10 or 12 microseconds easily from, with this hardware. And the, this NIC is... In, he, is included on the motherboard, so you have nothing to buy apart from the server in the beginning. Very cool. Very cool. So, so actually, I heard you say gigabit in there. You didn't even say 10 gigabit. So this works off any Ethernet, yes. next, right? Not but just it, 10 gigabit next. You just need Linux to support it right now. OpenMX only works on Linux, and we need the driver to be available on Linux, and that's it. So what exactly is needed to make OpenMX work? Is it something that lives in user space or just something we have to, is it a kernel module? Yes, you have to load a kernel module because basically you need to tell the kernel that when it receives a packet uh, with this type of, of, um, of Ethernet header, it needs to pass the packet to the OpenMX stack and only the kernel can do that. So we just need to load this kernel module which processes the packet on the receive side and then once you get everything decoded in the kernel you can pass it to the user space library which does basically uh, give just give it to the mpi layer and we're done so then can an, can a nick that you've put the open mx driver into can we still run regular tcp traffic for like nfs and management on that same interface or do we have yeah, to no have problem. Oh, oh, okay. So we don't have to have a separate wire for management and for um, message passing. Yeah, because in Linux and all drivers that we have in Linux, you can receive multiple types of packets at the same time. You can have IP and IPv6, for instance, but you can have IP and OpenMX at the same time. There's no problem. You can receive a, a lot of different packet types at the same time. That's actually a big difference between OpenMX and, for instance, Gamma, which is another, another old project working on doing HPC on a regular Ethernet NIC. With Gamma, you have to modify your driver to do probably better performance at OpenMX, but you break IP. So basically you need to use one NIC for, for HPC and one NIC for everything else, which can be a problem for people. And you need to patch your kernel and other things to do that. In OpenMX, we don't need to do that. We just load a kernel module and we have another feature that, but everything else still works. Yeah, very nice, very nice. So, so actually, <laughs> that's something that my company is, is quite big on, this whole converged uh, uh, networking kind of thing. So you can have different types of message passing on, on the same wire, and, and that's very important to a lot of people. Just, just one wire, and I can get my high-performance MPI out there and my commodity TCP traffic or NFS traffic or you know, whatever it is. Um, let me ask you this. Why, why did you create this project? Why, you know, how, do, how does Miracom feel about this? So actually, Miricom was involved in the process creation because they wanted basically to have MX work on other hardware because it works very well on their hardware, but they want it to, to be available to more people because they think their design is very good. And I'm, I'm qu I quite agree with that because their API is very similar to, to MPI, for instance, and people want to do, to do MPI anyway. So they want to have MX available everywhere. And OpenMX is the way to do that. You can have the same API. Actually, you can take MPitch or OpenMPI, and even if you build them on top of MX, you can just link them on top of OpenMX. It will, it will work fine. So it's a way for them to have a lot of application available in the world. And 
they, w they work on MX, and now they can work on all hardware in the world, basically. No, well, I certainly like that, being an open MPI guy, that we don't have to do anything, and we just magically work with both MX and open MX. Um, Follow-up question on this. Um, so I, I still didn't quite get the, the zen of, of why Miracom wants this. Doesn't this cut into their sales? Or am I, if I read a little bit deeper into your answer there, is OpenMX and MX wire protocol compatible such that if there's an open source version of it, it actually does benefit Miracom because then there's more software out there that can talk to their hardware? Yes, you can have OpenMX on one side and MX on the other side if you have Miracom hardware. It works, but I, I feel it's not very important in the end because most people will have just one type of, of communication and hardware in the, on their fabric in HPC. But if you want to have some specialized hardware on one side and regular hardware on the other side, it's fine. Actually, it's what's happening in uh, BlueGene P in Argon. In all BlueGene P from IBM, you have regular Botcom 10G Nix on one side, and on the other side, you have Miracom Nix running MX. And if you want to make this guy talk together, you need to have something with the same wire protocol. So what they do right now is running IP on the Ethernet side and do IP over MX on the other side, and it works. But if you do IP for this, and you just run PVFS on top of IP, it's a bit of a waste because PVFS can do better things directly on top of MX. So what they want to do in BlueGNP in Argon is just remove IP and have PVFS on top of OpenMX talk to PVFS on top of MX. But this is very interesting, but most people really don't care about that because they will have the same hardware on both sides anyway. But yeah, we, you can have the same wire protocol in OpenMX and in MX as well as the same interface as the application layer. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. Well, the reason I'm kind of harping on this whole, you know, what does Miracom think about this is because I've actually had some of our customers say to us, well, you know, OpenMX sounds great, but how long is it going to be before Miracom sues them and the project goes away? And, and it sounds like, you know, since you said they're, they were involved in creating OpenMX and they've kind of given it their blessing that, you know, th they're actually happy about it and it's, it's ne there's not going to be an intellectual property issue. No, there's no problem. We have an official contract with them. They're actually giving us some hardware to, to help us do the development. So there, there's no problem with that. They totally agree with, with our work. All right. So that's actually an important message, particularly to the enterprise kinds of customers, that uh, this is a blessed and a good project. And uh, it, it's yeah. not something that running them is going to open them up to litigation at all. Yeah. I have a quick question then. Um, so you said it's just a kernel module that can be installed so I can use stock kernels from Red Hat and that it basically works with anything that supports regular MX. Is there any other gotchas? Like, will it work with bonded interfaces for, say, supporting something like Luster? Like, I noticed you mentioned PVFS, but can you actually put OpenMX on top of a bonded interface? Well, in Linux, if you have a bonded interface, you see it like a, a virtual interface, but you can manipulate it like any other interface. So you can run OpenMX on a bonded interface. It, it doesn't change anything. I, I think I only tried once. The performance wasn't very good, but I think the, the Linux channel bonding performance isn't very good in the end. So I haven't really looked at that yet. It's not clear yet if I should uh, do the bonding in OpenMX or let Linux do it. That's something I will look at maybe one day, but you can do hey. it. You can, you can do it with the Linux channel. Hey, but, bonding. you know, uh, with my particular bias, we have OpenMPI do the application-level bonding for you anyway, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. right. This, this is actually a, a kind of a common question. Should we have the kernel do it, or, we, or should we have some upper-level protocol thing? And, and my particular bias is is clear, but I, I think there's probably interesting things to look at in the kernel level as too, but it's not my uh, particular area of expertise. I think Bryce would be able to comment much better on whether that's worthwhile or not. What I heard on Linux channel bonding is, was really bad, so, and I, I think OpenAPI does uh, the multi-interface stuff pretty well, so maybe just in us for us, and I don't have anything to do. I don't know. <laughs> For example, one of the machines I work with is split across two different geographic locations, and normally we use a scheduler to keep jobs from running across that, but can MX actually work over a routed network, or does it have to be like switched network? Like, What's the limitation? How far out can you actually have um, open MX? So if you have some 
if you are, you need to route your packets in between some fabrics, you have IP basically, and we don't use IP because we are another stack which is basically parallel from IP. You have TCP and IP on one side, and you have MPI and MX on or Open MX on the other side. It's totally different, and we cannot do any routing in in MX. It has been designed for small clusters, which are basically all machines in, in the same room, so we don't need any road router or anything like that. So, no, right, it so doesn't you're work. You're mirroring the, the, you know, the architectural decisions of MX itself, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And okay, and actually, that is, it's just frames over Ethernet, just Ethernet data. Yes. Nothing, nothing higher level, not even UDP, IP, anything like no. that? No. Okay, because so we, actually, that, that I wanted to ask this earlier, and I kind of missed that question, that what makes OpenMX so fast? You know, why is it faster than TCP? And, and what I'm gleaning from your answer is that you're, you're just chopping out all kinds of CPU processing on the server, that you've avoided the whole TCP stack, the IP stack, the UDP stack. You're just sending and receiving frames over Ethernet. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, right. We don't want to have all the TCP stuff for congestion and long distance and, I don't know, congestion window and stuff like that, which is very expensive. And we don't care about that because we're supposed to, to have a short distance network, uh, pretty much no congestion on the on the fabric. So we don't care about all that. We don't want to, to lose uh, time and CPU uh, cycles to, to handle this. So we just bypass all this stack and write our, our own stack and do just what we need and make it fast. That's it. Yeah, that actually, I have to admit, this is the only piece of software where I've done the podcast before playing with the software. And since you can run the TCP IP for like your storage and stuff on the same interface, I'm really going to have to try this out. This sounds like a real, like, I don't know. It almost sounds like magic that you can take our existing hardware and in software pretty much cut our latency down by 3x, 4x. I really need to try this out. Of course, it also means, Jeff, I have to go rebuild all my MPI libraries now. <laughs> well, but that's okay. <laughs> it depends if you, if you build your, your MPI libra- libraries for MX, it's fine. <laughs> well, all we have right now is TCP and IB. <laughs> but most of our cluster is just... Uh, um, Ethernet. Like I noticed you mentioned Gamma either earlier and you have to patch your network and back when I first looked at that it only worked with like Intel NICs. Yes, we because buy hardware at you know random times and some of them show up with Broadcom and some of them show up with Intel NICs and some of them have Nvidia NICs. This will work with all of those because it works with just Ethernet, yes. right? Right, yeah. So we basically don't... you're you're just talking to the Linux Ethernet driver. So me, me being a you know a user level software guy, the way I envision your stack is that you've got some user level library that just talks to kernel stubs, that talks to your you know the MX kernel driver, which then just talks to the Linux Ethernet driver, right? And actually, I don't talk directly to the driver. I just talk to the Linux virtual interface for all drivers. So that's why I don't need to modify any driver. I just use a regular interface that IP and IPv6 and other protocols use as well. Uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this is really compelling, actually. I mean, you take your existing hardware. It just goes faster, works with any Ethernet NIC, and you can you know, combine everything on, on a single wire. That's, that's very compelling. Yeah. All right, let me ask another question here. Um, so OpenMX has been around for a while. What, what, what's your current version? Uh, so it's 1.05, and we're working on doing 1.1 in the next months, probably. What, what can we expect to see in 1.1? So 1.0 was basically the first table without all, f- all performance improvements that we could do in the first table release. So 1.0 worked fine, but for instance, we didn't have a lot of very high performance support for um, 9K MTU or 1500 MT, 1500 MTUs, things like that. So in 1.1, we're going to change all this so that we can use the whole wire and uh, use larger packets. If you have 9K MTU, you don't want to... Uh, basic, I, I need to explain what MX does because MX doesn't have really a notion of, of MTU or things like that, like uh, regular Ethernet fabrics. And... On Ethernet, you need to, to respect this, this M- maximal transmit unit, MTU. And since we are wire compatible with MX, uh, we want to, to send packets like MX does, which is just send 4 key, key kilobytes uh, packets, and that's it. And if you have a 9K MTU, it's bad because you're not going to, 
to use the, the, the wall wire capacity, basically. So what we have in OpenMX is, by default, you are wire, comp wire compatible with MX, but if you don't care about talking to MX direct directly, you can just disable wire compatibility and use larger packet. And in OpenMX 1.1, we're going to do that for real. In 1.0, we didn't really use everything we could. So the performance is going to be much better for 9K MTU and uh, 1500 MTU in 1.1. And we have a couple additional features, but it's fairly technical details, so I'm not going to list all of them. <laughs> That's it. There's always more work to do, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Bryce, uh, who, who's using OpenMX? I know this is kind of a hard question to answer for an open source project. I, I get asked this about my projects all the time. You know, all I know is that people have downloaded it. But do you, do you know of any you know, real-world installations of OpenMX out there? No, I'm not aware of any. Uh, well, I'm aware of some people testing it, but there's no production machine using it from what I know. And I hope I would be aware if it was the case. But, yeah, it's, it's not easy to... to to know what people are doing with it because you only get reports when they have bugs and well maybe there's no bug but <laughs> I guess <laughs> people could sometime uh, um, just tell me yeah it works fine uh, thanks and I don't know maybe ask for improvements but I don't think anybody's using it for serious stuff yet because it's still young I think the the first table release was came out maybe six months ago so it's not clear that people are, are already ready to, to use it uh, for production. Uh, so right now, I think some people are using it on small networks and just doing some benchmark and thinking of just stopping using TCP and switching to OpenMX. And we have some interesting plans, uh, uh, like uh, there's a university in Northern America. I'm not sure I can give the name and location yet. Uh, they plan to use OpenMX on a 2000 node cluster. It will be basically some regular servers with uh, 1 gigabit Ethernet hardware and with a 10 gigabit Ethernet core in the, in the fabric. And they want to do OpenMX on this 2000 node. It's supposed to happen within a month or two, I think. And we have BlueGNP, but BlueGNP is very hard to, to, to use because the hardware is very specific and the performance is bad so far. So I, I have a lot of work to do there if I want to, to actually get BlueGNP to switch from IP over MX and IP to open MX and MX. Right, this is something right. interesting, but a lot of work because BlueGNP is really different from a regular server that we have in, a, in our clusters. What's, what's the biggest cluster that you've ever tried to scale out to with OpenMX? Oh, it's fairly small, actually. It's probably 12 nodes and with four or eight jobs per node, so it's, it's very small. We don't have a lot of large cluster in France, and actually it takes a lot of time, a, a lot of time to, to do this kind of experiment. So I'm, I, I'm actually uh, talking with my, my lab to get an engineer uh, working on this kind of stuff because I just can do the development and uh, do this kind of testing uh, on, a de on a per day basis. There's nothing that's keeping people from using this in production. Like, would you say it's it's pretty good to go, pretty well baked? Well, it seems to work fine, but when you have to load a custom kernel module, you you need to be root first, and still you you it's hard to to trust that my code is going to work because if it fails in the kernel, you're going to crash the machine. Maybe I don't know, disturb other applications and maybe corrupt your hard drive. It could happen. We never know. So. I can understand that people are not very comfor comfortable with loading this custom kernel module, so that's probably a reason why it takes time to, for people. Well, to, to be to fair, though, I mean every every proprietary high speed, you know, large bandwidth, low latency network requires some kind of kernel module thing. So it's it's always a little bit of a leap of faith. And and to be honest, for those of us who are not you know application developers. Even just the MPI is, is a, a big leap of faith itself because nobody wants to dive into that stuff. So my, my personal bias is that if it's below your application, it's a leap of faith, regardless of whether it's a kernel module or a, or a library. So you know, oh, I, I think uh, what, we're, what we're saying here is, you know, let's have people try it. You want people to try this, right, Bryce? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so let's, let's try it at scale and shake out the bugs and get this into a mature, mature platform that's, uh, that's good for us all to use. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's no bugs, right? There's no bugs. It's perfect. <laughs> I, I got a kernel panic yesterday, uh, but 
The problem no. is Kernel. <laughs> don't, don't admit that. Don't admit that. <laughs> uh, I know. The, kernel with, the problem with kernel module is that you have lots of uh, highly patched kernel out there, like Red Hat or other distributions are going to patch a lot. And sometimes you find the special kernel with some slight modification and you, you, you try to support it. So it, I just need to wait for people to try on a, on a new kernel and let me know where some, something goes bad. But apart from this kind of stuff, which should be fairly easy to fix, you just need to get the kernel sources and see what, what's going on in there. Uh, everything else seems to work fine these days. So I'm quite comfortable with running it from my own application at least. So quick question, how did this project get started? You said you have Miracom's blessing and they've supported you with some hardware. Um, did you work with them at all before this where this idea came up or were, did you start working on this and then they got on board? How did you get involved? So I start, it's starting a long time ago, actually. In 2001, I did an internship in, in Mary, at Miracom in California because we had some people in, in my school, school laboratory working with them. And so I went there. It was fun. So uh, during my PhD, a couple of years later, I wanted to work on similar things. So I just set up a contract with them to, to develop in MX because they needed um, basically an in, a programming interface in the kernel for Luster or maybe to the NFS RDMA, things like that. They didn't have a kernel interface, so uh, I worked on that on my PhD, during my PhD. It was fun, so I went there for postdoctoral position during a year, because in France we have to go abroad for a year between the PhD and getting a, a nice position, a research position later. So I went there for a year and came back to France, and we talked with them to set up this collaboration, and that's it. So I'm... I'm I know a lot about MX internal, so it's it's much easier for me to to um, take some stuff from MX and implement them in OpenMX. Uh, maybe it's, it's different because the hardware cannot do the same kind of things, but at least I know a lot of the semantics and internal stuff, so it's much easier for me to do that than probably right, anybody still else. Saying, uh, still saying clean from an intellectual property perspective. Yeah, there's no problem. We we have discussed with that uh, with them about that, and they're okay with that. Okay, good. So, a related question: what's what's the license of OpenMX? So, we have a kernel module, and like many kernel modules, we are GPL. It could be something else, like a dual GPL BSD or things like that. But for kernel module, it's basically the same. It's open source and compatible with the kernel module, or it's not. OpenMX is compatible and GPL, and that's what it exactly exactly is. Uh, in user space, we have our library, which is LGPL. So some people are afraid of GPL, so don't be afraid, please. LGPL is not like BSD because you have to provide the source of your code if you distribute it, but you can link your proprietary application with LGPL. There's no problem. That's why LGPL exists. It's not like, like GPN, GPL, which has some viral contamination problem. LGPL doesn't have this kind of problem. You can link with OpenMX and you're, you're fine. So it's open source and compatible with proprietary applications. Okay. Um, you, but... <laughs> who, uh, who else is involved in OpenMX? Is it, is it mainly you, or are you, are you looking to make a community out of this, or, or what, what's your plans? Uh, so I've been alone for a couple of months. Now there's an engineer working with me uh, in France. And I get some support from Miracom and external people from time to time when, for instance, they find that it doesn't compile or on their, their kernel or, or stuff like that. Uh, I'd like to get some help from other people. Maybe thanks to your interview, it will be, I will get some, some proposal from other people. It'd be great because this is very interesting, but it's kind of hard to work on this kind of software. So if some good people are interested in working on that, I would be very happy to get some help. But right, so, so it's a little, a little more complicated than, say, a, you know, a Google Summer of Code project, but you're looking for someone who's into kernel internals and networking protocols and things like that. What kind of qualifications you know, would somebody need to be able to work on this project? If you, have, if you know how to program the Linux kernel, it's very good, but you don't need that, actually, because a, lot, a large part of the code is actually in user space where, where you deal with uh, 
where you have request queues and you want to post request if a packet gets lost you want to, to requeue it so you have a lot of management of requests like that which is very similar to things that could happen in an MPI implementation so if people are familiar with implementing MPI they are probably can work in, in the OpenMX library as well uh, there's nothing specific about network drivers or protocol it can be good if you have an idea of how it works in, in the low level driver because you want to use them in the right way to, to make make the thing go fast, but you don't need to, to know a lot. And since most of the code is already there, you don't need to, to write everything from scratch. So you can learn by just looking at the code, I guess. It's not very hard to, to understand, I think. Okay, well, that's cool. Actually, that's a little surprising to me. I, I wouldn't have guessed that. So that's, that's really good information. So let me, um, I, I got one other random question that I forgot to ask you earlier here. Um, so we talked about how OpenMX is just using, you know, the Ethernet drivers and, and it, well, actually the general virtual device driver down in, in the kernel there. Could you potentially get any benefit if the, if you did have a hardware offload capable kind of card? Like if it's a, a you know, a, a tow engine or something like that, a TCP offload engine or, or other kind of fancy hardware? Uh, that's actually something I'm looking at uh, these days because that's a, a very important question and People want to put some stuff in, in the NIC, but I'm not sure they are doing what I need, actually. Um, for instance, in HPC NICs, you can do zero copy because the NIC is able to decide where to put the data in memory di directly. Uh, regular NICs cannot do that, so you have to copy the data. So some people will say you need this RDMA, basically, capability in the NIC if you want to do high-performance communication. In OpenMX, I didn't do that. What I did is using something that it, Intel added to the, their servers uh, maybe three years ago now. If you buy an Intel server these days, you get something called AOAT, which is um, input-output uh, acceleration technology. And thanks to this hardware feature, you can offload some memory copy, um, which you will usually do with the CPU. And thanks to that, you don't do zero copy, but you have zero copies that are processed by the, the host, basically. So it's almost the same, but you don't need anything in the NIC. And since this AOAT stuff is available in all Intel, Intel machines uh, nowadays, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I would say to people, don't bother implementing an RDMA in your NIC, for instance. Just use a regular server, and you will have AOAT, and the performance is almost the same. Uh, there are a lot, a, lot, a lot of other features that could be uh, could be interesting. Uh, TOE, I'm not quite a supporter of TOE because first they, they are not supported by Linux because there are some problems like if you want to, to filter packets with a firewall in your in, in your host, but everything the TCP stack is in the NIC, it doesn't work. I think there are some problems with uh, forwarding as well. So. TCP offload engine is not something I really like. Uh, I'm more a guy who, who will do um, stateless offload, which means you put some feature in the NIC, but you don't want to have a lot of instance uh, TSO, which is transmit segmentation offload for TCP, or Alaro, which is um, large receive offload for TCP are some very simple features that you can put in the NIC and it helps performance a lot, but you don't have a lot of changes to put in the, uh, to put in the NIC and in the, in the Linux kernel. I think I like this, this approach, which is put some very basic stuff in the NIC and try to help OpenMX with, with this kind of feature without added, adding a lot of features which are very expensive like RDMA or TOE. So well, in open that's, mix, that's, that's fascinating, actually, because when I said uh, TOE, as soon as I, it left my mouth, I'm like, oh, why, why am I saying that? We're talking lower than TCP here anyway. So, yeah, what you said actually makes perfect sense. And you actually perked up on my own little internal bias radar there for open MPI. I think I need to talk to you about some stuff after the interview. <laughs> um, so in open mix, we, we cannot use TSO or, or um, large receive of load or things like that. But I'm actually working on looking at what I can put in some, in some NIC firmware. So basically I'm using Miricom NICs, but you can put them in a Ethernet mode, which looks a bit confusing for people, but let's say it's a regular Ethernet NIC. Uh, I can modify the firmware and add some very simple feature in there to see if I can help open a mix. And actually if you add maybe 10 lines to, to do multicast, uh, not multicast, to do packet filtering, for instance, say um, if your packet arrives and it's going to 
uh, your, your first MPI application sends the corresponding interrupt to the first core because you know the application is running on this core and you want to avoid having part of the processing being on one core and then the application run on, on the other core because of cache problems. In te- with 10 lines in the firmware, you can do that and you reduce cache problems by maybe a factor of 10 and performance is m- much better. So I want to look at what kind of small feature like, like, this, like this packet filtering we can put in, in the Nix and help OpenMX. And I have a, some idea about interrupt coalescing and things like that that could be improved thanks to very small features that are easy to add to, to Nix. So you mentioned IO... Um, IOAT and that was an Intel thing. Are you actually working with Intel directly? Or are you working with any of the other NIC vendors um, to make OpenMX support it better? No, so IOAT is available in the Linux kernel for maybe two or three years now. TCP uses it, so I just took the TCP code and adapted it for OpenMX and that's it. There's no need for, for Intel to help me. Uh, we, we know how to use it, it's fine. Um, I'm not. I'm not in in contact with any um, vendor yet because I haven't published any numbers about what we, you can get if you add some support for OpenMX in the NIC. So once it's done, actually it's a research paper that I submitted, but it's not accepted yet. When it's done, maybe I could ask some some people to to actually put this kind of feature in the NIC. It's already in Mericom NIC because I can talk to them, and of course they agree to to insert this kind of stuff, but. Other NIC, like the one you get if you buy a random server out there, you won't get any OpenMX support, but once we have some numbers to, to prove people that it's interesting, maybe I could get that. Okay, so along those lines, you talked about some, some really interesting things upcoming. What, what do you see as the future of, of the OpenMX project? I mean, is there, is there a set of features and requirements that you're working towards and you know, then once you have that, you're, you're, you're done and, and the software will be complete and it won't really need any more development? Or, or do you foresee, you know, a never-ending source of things to investigate and improve on? Or, you know, wh- where do you see this going? So, for sure, my to-do list is, is very long uh, these days. Um, the main reason is that when I started implementing this, what I did, as I said in the beginning of the interview, is that you, I took what's in MX Nix and put it in a driver and we are done. Now that I've been doing that for a year, I know that some things are not really where they should be because there are some things that you can do in the NIC, but if you can't, maybe you don't want to put them in the Linux kernel, maybe you want to keep them in user space. So uh, after 1.1, maybe in, in a month or two, I think I'm going to rework part of the stack to move something maybe from user space to the kernel or from the kernel to user space so that you don't have a lot of synchronization between the kernel and user space, for instance, which can be expensive. Uh, also, maybe I can reduce some memory copies by moving the, the way I'm doing the matching in the library, things like that. So I, I'm now using some feedback from my own my own work and rethinking the way we should have implemented that in the, in the first place. I couldn't have guessed uh, all this, uh, this result first, so it's good that I, I tried one way and I failed and now I'm going to improve things. So I think OpenMX 1.2 will probably change a lot of things in, in the way we are um, emulating the NIC and where we are actually emulating it right now. And cool. later, I'd like to put OpenMX as a Linux kernel, but there's actually some work at Miricom for for doing a new MX release, a new major release. Right now it's MX 1.2 and they're going to do MX 1.3 maybe in a year or so. It's going to change a lot of things and I will have to make OpenMX compatible with that. So maybe I'll do the both big changes at the same time. So support the new MX 1.3 and rework everything I said at the same time because both of them will, will actually need a lot of work. So maybe it will be at the same time. And once this is done, I think I'll try to put this stuff in, in the Linux kernel so that people don't have to, to, to compile their own custom module any, any, anymore. Oh, that's right great. Now, one, one less reason to, uh, to uh, not use OpenMPI. You know, if it's just there, then, then there's a good reason. Just, oh, well, compile and use it. Great. Yeah. All right, let me ask you some, uh, some pedantic questions. I always love to ask other developers these questions. What, what editor do you use? What's your, what's your development oh. environment? Uh, f- it's it's not VI. It's sometimes Emacs and sometimes some very quick um, 
Uh, actually, I like Nano, which is a very small editor that some people use. And when I have two lines, <laughs> when I have two lines to change, I just use Nano because I don't want to to launch Emacs and wait a couple of seconds. So, it's Emacs for long long standing changes and modifying a lot of stuff. But for quick changes and just uh, modify two lines and recompile, I just use Nano most of the time. But I'm an Emacs guy apart from that. So you don't use too much of a development environment. You're uh, you're an email, no. you're a text editor and a and a terminal kind of guy. Yes. Yeah, same as me. That's that's good. <laughs> from my own personal opinion. All right. Other other question I'd like to ask everybody: what uh, what version control system do you use for your software? Uh, so I like SVN. Well, I, I used TBS for a long time, but I was really bored about not being able to rename files without losing the story or stuff like that. So I don't use TBS anymore. So nowadays I use SVN, but mostly because people uh, know SVN and don't want to use a distributed version controller. But for my own work, I use Git most of the time because I'm, I've been working with the Linux kernel and other, other projects that use Git. So what basically for my OpenMX work, uh, the repository is SVN. And I use Git SVN on top of it because I like Git, and that's it. Git, another Git user. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know OpenMPI is going to switch to Mercurial one day, but it's probably similar to Git anyway. So, as I, as I understand, they're pretty they're pretty feature complete. Yeah. Or, or feature compatible. Sorry, is what I meant to say there. Yeah. No, I, I've. I never used SVN or anything beforehand. I'm like, I'm gonna try out this Git thing, and I've been, I've been using Git. I've never used CVS or SVN, and now I use Git. So, I'm probably one of the stranger people out there. So, Bryce, I'm gonna kind of wrap it up here. Um, the website for OpenMX. So it's open-mx.org, and that dash is important, right? That that, yes. that dash is important in the name, right? Yes. Okay, and so you can just download everything there, and there's documentation and a mailing list? Yes, exactly. You have a long FAQ, which covers all problems I, I met so far, but maybe some people will, will, have, will add uh, something. Uh, and, yeah, you can download everything you want there. And there's some documentation inside the tarball, too, if you need, but the FAQ should be fine. Okay, well... Thanks a lot for your time. Uh, Thank you for I'm gonna, Yeah, I'm definitely going to go try this out myself. Cool. Well, again, uh, Bryce, we appreciate your time. Thanks for telling us all about uh, well, what I, I personally think is a fascinating project. I, I hope this gets very popular. And like I said earlier, everybody tries it. We shake out the bugs and it becomes, you know, great stuff that the world just automatically uses. I hope so. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. No problem. Bye. Thanks a lot for getting a hold of us. Thanks, Bye. Oh. Whoops, I might have cut him off just a little early there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought we were all done. Okay. That was cool. Yeah, no, that was that that's neat. Like like I said, it's the only software that we've talked to so far that I haven't actually tried ahead of time, but I'm definitely gonna go try it afterwards because like I said, we're mostly running gigabit Ethernet and with our same hardware if we could get a couple thousand core up running on uh open MX and you know, our MPI library of course is open MPI and we can just recompile that and everything should be, you know, magic latency wonderful. Yeah, so I've I've talked with well, I've never actually physically talked with him, but I've emailed with Bryce quite a bit and I, you know, a lot of the questions I was asking him I already knew the answer and whatnot. But uh it you know, we've actually had to do a little work to make it so that, you know, OpenMPI would do both MX and OpenMX. So he had to do some work and we had to do some work. And But, you know, after that, it, it, it just works. I mean, you just compile and link against it and OpenMPI doesn't care. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, nice. I, I did some, uh, some internal benchmarking myself um, with some really good 10 gig NICs. Let's see, what, what was the latency? I think I was getting around six or seven micros. Um, on regular regular Ethernet hardware, just on regular. Well, they were really good 10 gig NICs, and this was like uh, I don't know, at least six to nine months ago. Um, so you know, back then they were pretty expensive NICs, and they probably still are now. But you know, if you can if you can take a regular old Ethernet NIC or perhaps even something that's on your motherboard and get in the range of 12 to 15 micros, man, that's that's just compelling. That's a lot of dollars saved right there. Yeah, I know. When I've profiled our system, we've got quite a collection of users supporting an entire university, and I think most of our users would benefit more from lower latency than a higher uh, bandwidth. So, 
you know, Devil's latency numbers are just really compelling in my world. Yeah, 